Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lecture 11, Social Implications of IT, Computers, and Polite Society. And on your syllabus, this says social IT. Now, if you notice, this little uh, theme actually says social networks on it. And for this lecture, we're really going to have a little discussion about social networks because I really want you guys to, to understand of some of these things. Um, now, some things you may of course recognize um, from um, just some of the topics that we're going to talk about but there are some things that you may not be aware of that i really want you all to be uh, paying attention to throughout this lecture because if you watch this entire thing and you pay attention to everything that is being shared you can actually immediately apply this information as soon as you're done okay this is something that you really want to make sure that you're applying in your everyday life. And so if there was one lecture that I know you could definitely apply as soon as you finish watching this, it is definitely this one. So pay close attention and um, we will um, go ahead and get started. Okay, so what I'm gonna discuss is how social networks actually improve society. There's a lot of negativity with social networks um, these days, um, and I don't have to you know, repeat that twice for you all to know, but uh, not very many people really focus on really how social networks actually improve our society and their original intent of what they were created for. We're also gonna talk about the importance of netiquette and what that is. And then we're also going to talk about password essentials and software licenses and copyright. So these are some topics that you're really going to need to pay attention to, especially if you have some sort of business or maybe you want to own your own business one day. Um, or if you want any type of social media presence, you really need to pay attention to um, these topics today. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is crowdsourcing, and the definition of that is solving a problem or achieving a goal by combining the contributions of a large, unconstrained volunteer population. Now, some examples of this are Wikipedia, you know, that's definitely the online encyclopedia for people to add things to. Um, I don't recommend looking up information on Wikipedia just because it's not necessarily a um, credible resource, um, but um, Wikipedia is definitely one because others can add information to it um, and that people can use or research. And then a blog as well. Um, I know many of you probably know what blogs are, but um, these are basically just online uh, forums, basically, where people post um, different things and then people can comment underneath them. Um, forums as well. Um, it's another type of online forum where people can go and ask questions. Um, the difference between a forum and a blog is where someone may post something that's very similar to um, an article of some sort, and then people comment on that. But what mostly happens in forums is that people answer or people post questions and provide answers. Um, Yahoo Answers is a great type of forum that you may be familiar with. And then also multi-user gaming. So if you're somebody that does um, Xbox and maybe you have an Xbox profile and you, you know, go on and play games with multiple users online, whether you know them or not, that's an example of crowdsourcing as well because you are, um, you're providing information to the game along with those many users that you may be playing with. Okay, so this is actually gonna be a discussion question inside of um, your uh, discussions on our class, but I really want you to think about this. If etiquette is the guidelines for proper behavior in social situations, then what is netiquette? Okay, so this will be something that you can answer as well in your discussion questions in our class on Canvas. Okay, so email netiquette, okay? Now, the thing with email netiquette that you have to understand is that there is a proper way to write emails, okay? Um, we don't always think about this when we are sending emails back and forth, but you have to remember, um, there are certain things that you wouldn't put in a letter to someone in the mail now, right? So it's the same way with an email, okay? So 
So these are some key points to remember as you are um, typing emails or even responding to emails. Okay, um, number one is make sure that you are putting one topic at a time inside of the email. Um, now, for example, um, let's say that you needed to ask me a question about your grade and you sent me an email about your grade. That's also not the time to ask me in the same email um, if you left your jacket in class, okay? You wanna make sure that you separate the topics because you don't wanna confuse the reader, okay? And then also, um, you may not know exactly, you know, what it is that that reader has to read that day. People get so many different emails and they don't wanna really waste time, okay? They really want you to get, the, get to the point of the topic of the email. So it's best to do one topic at a time. Okay, include context, okay? Whenever you are replying back to an email, there's always um, an option now, um, I believe in most emails, where you can say if you wanna include the context or include the previous message. Always do that so that people understand and know what it is you are talking about. Unless it's a brand new topic, be sure to include the prior messages in your response because that way, people can um, properly read the backlog and understand what the purpose of the email is, okay? Use an automated reply. If you know that you're gonna be gone, okay, or if you know you're gonna be out of office per se, um, which, you know, if you're gonna be out of office at work or something like that, make sure that you use an automated reply, okay? And one thing um, I'm actually going to show you guys uh, probably how you can do that um, in just a second when I get off of this lecture. I'll show you guys how to do that if you're not familiar with that because I know um, not very many of you probably have used this before, but when you get into an office setting when you're working for someone, people are going to need to know when you're out of the office. So using an automated reply is, is best. And I'm also going to be... Um, using one as well, uh, probably just for our course, um, because I'm gonna be out of town this weekend. So if you need to respond to me, um, then just know that I may or may not get to your email this weekend, so I'm gonna be out of town. But along with that being said, just remember to use an automated reply whenever you're gonna be gone for long periods of time. And then answer your email in reverse order. Always answer new mail first, okay? You wanna make sure you do that um, because old messages can time out, okay? So you may have one email that you may not have realized has already been responded to. So if you try to go back and answer old mail, then you may not realize, you, and oh, that's already been responded to by someone. Okay, especially if you're on a multiple chain email. And then um, also um, always read the backlog, okay? Read the old messages, but respond to the new ones first, okay? That way you can stay current in your responses to your emails. And then also clarify your email ownership, <laughs> okay? One thing that I really do wanna say about this is this, okay? Make sure you're sending it to the right person, okay? Um, there was a situation um, that of a couple that I know, um, the husband was wanting to surprise his wife with a graduation ceremony. And he didn't notice that he emailed the invitation and included her in the invitation. And he didn't realize that he did that. But luckily for him, because they are married, they have passwords to each other's accounts. So he was able to go in and remove and delete the email before she saw it. Now, you may not get that opportunity. So just make sure that you clarify who you are sending your emails to all the time. And always double check and make sure you're sending it to the right person before you click send. 
and then use emojis and you know emoticons okay some people think that that's not really good email netiquette but it helps people understand the tone of your email so it's always best to use those as well especially if you're in a situation where you're not sure if the receiver or the recipient is going to understand the tone of your message here are just um some guidelines to kind of remember as well uh, when you are communicating especially um, by email okay um always act as if you are there in person okay how would you think about if you were actually sending an email to somebody and you were talking to them in person how would you act toward them okay wouldn't you want to you know be on your best behavior it's the same idea when sending an email. Some people tend to think that because they're behind a computer screen that they can't possibly hurt someone's feelings or that they don't need to be on their best behavior, but, but that's not true, okay? Always remember that there is a person behind that screen, even if you can't see them face-to-face. Uh, -face. And remember that you aren't there in person, okay? So that's one of the reasons why using emojis and emoticons are, are good, because it lets people know, okay, do you mean to, you know, use humor or, um, you know, what's, what's the tone of this message, you know? So when people are in face-to-face, -face, you can see automatically um, just how the tone of what they're saying is. And you can see their facial expressions, but remember that you're not there in person when you're sending an email. So always keep that in mind. Um, for one-on-one -on -one talks, okay, you never forward an email or other private communication without the sender's permission. So let's think about it, especially if it's a confidential conversation you're having with somebody in person, one-on-one. -on -one. It's the same way sending emails. You never forward on messages without that person's permission, especially if they told you to keep that confidential. Now, the flip side to that is never expect for an email to remain private, okay? Um, if you don't want somebody to know important information or confidential information, it's best to either call them um, or ask to meet them in person rather than sending it by text message or email because those things can be forwarded on and and they can get into the wrong hands so just make sure that you know if you want to keep something private that you decide to meet one on one or you decide to give them a call um now also remember this okay this is going to be especially important once i get to the part about social media all right delete doesn't remove the content okay this is so 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 true in anything with information technology and if you did not know this put this in your back noggin okay just because you delete something does not mean that it has been removed okay that's why it is important to watch what you're posting on social media watch what it is that you're sending to people and the number one reason why is because there are backups and data repositories for everything okay so i know when i was at my previous job and i worked as a database analyst um i remember we kept backups for at least 12 months or more and we had a specific database backup system that we kept all those um, all those copies on okay I wouldn't be surprised if they still have copies of files that I that I had from from way back when okay so and I tried to do my best to delete everything that I could but that doesn't necessarily mean it's completely gone so always remember that and so the etiquette here is if you don't want that to be seen or if you don't want something um, to be kept for long periods of time, don't send it or don't post it. Okay, that's going to be your best, your best, um, your best thought. Okay, um, and along the lines here of watch what you post because your boss or your future boss may see it. That is very true. Okay, I'll tell you guys another story. I actually got the opportunity to meet one of the board members for the Paul Dickens 
Paul Dickinson College of Business at OBU. And one of the things that he was sharing was that um, he was, you know, potentially wanting to um, hire a lady for his company, but then they checked out her social media and saw something that she posted and that kept her from getting the job. So if you think that coworkers or potential coworkers or potential employers are not watching your Facebook page, you are definitely not thinking the right thing, okay? Um, people are watching your social media page and they're, they are doing it now more so for people who they are potentially hiring because even though social media does not tell your entire life, it tells what you decide to share. Remember that. Social media is a tool for you to promote yourself and to share things about yourself. Even though it doesn't share everything about you, it shares what you decide to share. So if you are deciding to share all these negative things, people are going to see that and people are going to register that as, well, this may not be her life, but why is she sharing all these negative things on her page? You know, you get to decide how you want to portray yourself to people, okay? And while, you know, not everybody's perception of you may be correct, you can help keep them from having a negative perception of you by what you decide to share, okay? So again, be careful of that and be mindful that delete doesn't remove content. And I know I spent quite a few minutes on that, but I really wanted to hone in on that because that's something that a lot of people don't realize, okay? Don't waste your friend's resources, okay? Sending long rambling musings or huge image files wastes your friend's time and slows network connections or possibly server space. Be thoughtful, don't send or at least warn about the file size ahead of time. Okay, this makes me think about those chain messages that people send. You know, send this to 15 people and, you know, God will reward you at midnight or something, okay? Those types of messages are a waste of your friend's time, okay? And also, next, really hear me on this, okay? Avoid flame wars. These are nasty online exchanges in which a few people fight, but others see um, uh, copies or the posts, okay? Don't continue a flame war. Contact a flamer separately, okay? So basically what flame wars are are when people are online on social media, you know, arguing, you know, about certain things or, um, you know, um, having basically arguments on social media, okay? The way to end that is to contact the person separately, okay? I actually saw this, um, I actually saw this personally on my social media page on my Facebook one day, and there was a girl that posted something, and she was the only person that, um, you know, was, there was one person that reacted as a sad face, right? And so the person who posted it reacted to that person's decision to put a sad face on that person's post and she was now mind you she was the only person that put a sad face but the person that originally posted it called that person out and started being negative toward that person after she had given her response of why she you know put the sad face but that person who originally posted it should not have done that on public social media in the first place. That should have been done privately to that person if she felt offended by that person's reaction. So that's what it means by contact the flamer separately. You don't want to keep things going when you see negativity on posts. Make sure you, you privately contact people. And make sure you confirm addresses as well, okay? Before sending anything, make sure that you check um, that you check your um, to list and make sure that it's correct. Okay. Um, 
make sure that you're not accidentally sending a personal reply by clicking reply all when you meant to click reply, okay? If you do that, follow up immediately with an apology, okay? So this is just some guidelines and, and responsible behaviors to remember, okay? Now, what do you think you should do if you saw a message like this, okay? Now, this won't necessarily be in your discussion question, but I really want you guys to think, what should you do if you see something like this, okay? Especially if it's from somebody that you may not know, you know, or something is from an address that you may not recognize, okay? What should you do? Now, First, in order to understand that, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about passwords, all right? But going back to this, whenever you see this, you definitely should not click on the link or even reply to that person, especially if you don't know the person and especially if it ends up in your junk mail, okay? And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in just a second, but that's definitely something that you should not do. You should not click on the, in the link and you should not respond. You should always forward these types of things to um, your IT department so that they can handle this properly, okay? Now, one, before I go on and talk more about that, I'm gonna talk about passwords, okay? For passwords, there's something called encryption. And what happens is um, these passwords cannot easily be read. Okay, so the example that I'm gonna give you guys is from a program called TrueCrypt. When I worked at my last job, we had to upload um, CDs of data to our um, machines. And in order for me to do that, I had to decrypt the CD by you know, putting in a certain password in order to be able to decrypt all of the data before I was to upload it to the system. And the reason why is because the data was being transferred by CD. And so whenever, um, whenever um, private and personal important data is transported by CD, you need to make sure that it is encrypted, okay? But I had to use a tool called TrueCrypt in order to decrypt that and then be able to use the data for our system, okay? Now, there's also something called a one-way cipher, okay? This means that the password should not be able to be decrypted easily, and no one should know the password, okay? So an example with a password recovery, if you for some, some reason need to recover your password, usually what will happen is the site will tell you, okay, it will say, um, you know, reset your password, and then it will send you an email for you to be able to reset your password to that account, okay? Now, that's why it's important that people don't know your passwords, because people are easily getting into emails nowadays, and so when they see emails like that, their hackers are going to be looking for opportunities to reset the password and get into your account, so it's best that you make sure that your passwords are not seen by anyone, okay? Now, there's an example I'm gonna give you from CLO IT. CLO is the last place that I worked, it's called Commissioners of the Land Office. And whenever someone got locked out of their computer, what they had to do was they had to call us to give us, they had to call us to let us know that they were locked out and they had to have their password reset, okay? So if they could not log in, they had to call us and my director would reset their password. So none of us in IT could do it, only the director, okay? So that's something important to remember too as well. If you have your own business one day and you have your own IT department, you need to ensure that your director is the only person who resets passwords or it's somebody whose job is to do that. Because that way, um, that way you don't want people knowing, you know, what their password is. 
and not everybody always remembers to reset their password. So it's always good to have the director um, do that so that you can ensure that no one is getting into computers that they don't need to be. Okay, now I'm going to, I'm going to talk about good versus poor passwords now, okay? So a good password is something that nobody will guess and something that's easy to remember, okay? Now some poor passwords, they're very short passwords, okay? You don't want anything that's gonna be uh, three digits long that people can guess, okay? You also don't want something that's an obvious sequence like your name, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You don't want that either, okay? Um, and you don't want to use single dictionary words such as password or admin, okay? There have actually been situations where I found out that the password was password and the login was admin, okay? <laughs> so you definitely don't want to have those types of things because those can easily be guessed. Now, here's just some examples of how to create quality passwords. Now, for the easy to remember section, just choose the same topic, okay? It could be about planes, it could be about, um, you know, books, it could be about, um, you know, maybe some of your favorite types of books that you have read, okay? But what would make those hard to guess is if you recode the phrases. For example, this poor password has the two words hello there. Now, what you can do is you can, you can recode the phrase hello there, change all the E's to a number three and change the O to a zero. And that would be a good password, okay? You can also add symbols as well um, in addition to uh, numbers and capital letters, which is what most things are requiring you to use now. Okay, and that brings me to the rules for password creation, okay? Make sure that um, when you are creating passwords that you remember these four rules and most, um, most password sites now are requiring you to have either all of these rules or some combination of them. Rule number one, create a password that is eight or more characters. Like I said, you don't want something to be three characters, three or four characters that can be easily guessed, okay? Um, number two, include numbers, letters, and symbols, okay? Now, why would we wanna do that? It's because it makes it harder to guess, right? If you remember our example that I just showed you from hello there, how we changed the E's to the three and the O to the zero, okay? That helps people really not be able to guess what the password is. And then also, mix those numbers, letters, and symbols throughout, okay? If you notice, the hello there, obviously, we know all the E's are threes, and the O is a zero, but feel free to put, you know, other numbers and symbols just throughout, um, the, pass throughout the password. I know sometimes people replace letter A with the at symbol that we use in, in um, sending emails, okay? So there's all different kinds of ways you can do it. Um, number three is mix uppercase and lowercase letters, all right? People nowadays, you know, with, with English, they don't remember to, um, you know, think about mixing uppercase and lowercase letters when they're trying to guess passwords. So that will be um, easy for people to not guess. And then avoid dictionary words, like avoid, um, for example, going back to hello there, okay? Avoid words like that. Avoid, um, you know, just words that can be easily guessed. And then you also don't want to put your name inside of the password unless, again, you are replacing certain letters with numbers. Do not use your name because that's something that can be easily guessed as well unless you're going to have a great combination of letters, numbers, and symbols. But I would just avoid using your name altogether. Okay, um, and these are just um, three examples of different passwords that you can use. Um, just for example, I'll just show you guys the first one. So um, the first one says, may force be with you, okay? So they change the may to a number five, then they change the four to a number four, 
then they changed the word U to the letter U, and then they changed um, the C-E-B-E, -E, which remained, to C-B, okay? So their password is now 54CB with you, okay? So that's just a good way to make it um, hard to guess, but also easy to remember, okay? Everybody can remember that May is five numerically, you know, and four could be the number four as well, okay? So it will still read um, May force be with you, but it represents it as 54C be with you, okay? All right, so I want you to answer this in the discussion question as well. Has someone ever tried to scam you online, okay? I had a situation where someone tried to scam me and it was not pretty at all, okay? It was not pretty at all, okay? Um, what they tried to do once is they tried to, you know, contact me through, so I have an online business and they tried to contact me through my contact form and tried to send me a letter in the, or a check in the mail saying I could deposit that money and send them the money back. Well, what would have happened is the check would have bounced and then I would have been in trouble instead of that person. So make sure that, you know, you are careful with a lot of these people, you know, trying to scam you and send you things online because, and because we can't always see people, that's what happens, okay? One thing that I always try to do with people is if their email address doesn't come up under any type of social media platform, I don't respond to them. Or if I see them, you know, on their page and they don't have any pictures and they don't have a profile picture, cover photo, whatever, or if for some reason they, um, or if for some reason they have, um, a, maybe a fan page, but there's like nothing on it. I always make sure that they have some type of content and that I can actually interact with the person before I even try to pay for anything online. If it's not something that's, you know, already trusted like Amazon or anything like that, because there are people out here who are, are really trying to take your money and, and they're not all for you. So you want to be, you want to be careful of that. Now there's actually something called the Nigerian window scam, okay? And, and this is also called the 419 fraud, okay? So let's just read this and, and see what happens here, okay? So, dear sir, it is with heart full of hope that I write to seek your help in the context below. I am Mrs. Munarat Abasha, the second wife of the former Nigeria head of state, late General Sani Abasha, whose sudden death occurred on 8th of June, 1998. Having gotten your particulars from the family library, I have no doubt about your capacity and goodwill to assist us in receiving into your custody for safety the sum of, uh, of U.S. $20 million willed and deposited in my favor by my late husband, plus 24 karat gold dust worth USD uh, $5 million. Okay, so this is basically very similar to the scam that I just shared with you guys um, about with my own personal situation. Okay, so this person is trying to get someone to deposit a certain amount of money into their account, but what's going to happen is the check would bounce. And so this Nigerian window scam is very, 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 very popular. Um, so you have to be, you know, very, very careful with this, okay? Now, this is how the 419 scam works, okay? This is just a little bit more details about it. Someone you never heard of claims to have great wealth that they cannot access. They ask for your help in transferring the money usually out of their country. For your help, they intend to give you a large share of the money. They emphasize that the operation is confidential and you can't tell anybody, okay? Now there's a red flag right there. If you were getting a lot of money, why wouldn't you wanna tell someone? Okay, especially if it was really gonna help your family out, 
okay? After you agree to help, things go wrong with the transfer, okay? So if you remember from my personal story, I never deposited this check nor cashed it or whatever. I ripped it up and threw it in the trash when I figured out what was going on, okay? And so you just have to be careful of that, okay? They need some money to bribe officials or pay various fees before they can get the money out, okay? You give them the money thinking you will get much more in the future. This is the advanced fee part. The scammers need more and more money as time passes. Eventually, you threaten them and they disappear. Okay. So, Basically, this, this, this scam is somebody is trying to, you know, get money that they really don't even have. Okay, so you have to be careful of this. All right, so phishing. All right, let's move on to that. Um, phishing is short for password harvesting phishing. It has to do with passwords. Okay, now this is the social engineering process of convincing people to give up personal data voluntarily. Okay, so this doesn't just happen online, okay? This could happen um, even when you're in person. Somebody could, you know, be at go to the academic center and, you know, you know, just pretend that they're on the phone just angry about their daughter's grades. And then all of a sudden, you come up to the, they come up to you and you work in the academic academic center and they say, you asked, is something wrong? And they'll say, man, I'm just really concerned about my daughter's grades. Can I find out? But we have a policy here at OBU that they cannot find out grades unless um, the student has said that, you know, they, they can know their grades and they give proper identification, okay? So we have you all fill out a form here um, at the school that says, you know, who you want to have access to your grades and other information. So we always have to check that form first before we can um, talk to your parents about your grades. Okay. So that's just an example of phishing. Okay. Now, another example of phishing is when, um, is when somebody says, okay, well, all these pop-ups start coming up and then all of a sudden you have all these things wrong with your computer, okay? And then they're asking you to pay money to fix those problems. Now, here's a couple red flags. Number one, if you've already gotten antivirus on your computer, then you're not going to need to pay anybody else to fix your issues on your computer, okay? That's the first red flag. Secondly, okay, you don't just start putting in your credit card information from somebody that you don't even know, okay? You're gonna have to really make sure that, that you can tell that it is a fake website. And most of the time you can is if in the left corner, it doesn't show a secure box, okay? If it doesn't show a lock or it doesn't show that it's secure, then that's not a site where you need to be giving your um, card information, okay? Unless you've already spoken with the person already, you know, personally, and they've taken you to that website. So just be, just be careful of that, okay? So right here is an example of something, okay? Clicking on links in the email is one of the things that we detest very much here at OBU. Um, IT department tells us all the time, do not click on emails or email links that you don't even know, okay? There's a couple problems here, all right? Number one, okay, take a look at that email address, okay, from Brooke, okay, Brooke who, and then BR, but there's nothing else, at davidson.edu, okay? Um, and then also it says to undisclosed recipients, okay? That's another red flag, okay? Most of the time, most of the time, if it's coming to you, it is going to have your name or your email address inside of there, okay? But not always with the, with the scam, okay? Sometimes yours, 
sometimes you will have your email address, but the thing that you need to pay attention to mostly is the from email address. But that undisclosed recipients gives you um, a red flag too that, okay, obviously something's wrong here, okay? But then also, look at the very bottom of the email, ITS help desk, mail admin, okay? It doesn't even tell you in the bottom of the email who it's from. Does, is it really from Brooke? Does it even say? Okay, ITS help desk from where? Okay, I'm assuming that that means information technology services, but there are multiple places that have an information technology services department. So that's another red flag. So also do not click on links once again in those types of emails because you don't know who it's from and it wasn't even sent to you. Okay. Um, we will never at OBU send you emails to validate your, um, your account. You know, you won't see those things like that, okay? Um, there's processes already in place here at OBU for us to make sure that we validate you properly, okay? So that you will not have to worry about, all right? But the number one thing, don't click on links of emails you don't know and make sure you pay attention to the from um, section of the address and the to section, but then also pay attention at the very bottom of the email if it tells you who it is from, okay? All right, so how do you avoid phishing, okay? One of the ways that you can do, you can avoid phishing is um, you can make sure that you, you know, don't click on things in your email that you're not supposed to click on. Don't click on pop-ups. Don't give your information. Don't give out your credit card information to anybody who you have not already um, talked with that you're going to purchase the product or if it's not a actual secure official website such as Amazon or eBay, do not do that, okay? Um, you probably even need to be careful on eBay and Amazon as well, but most of those types of sites um, are pretty secure and they do actually have the secure lock in the left-hand section of the address bar. So those can be trusted. But all in all, don't give your personal information out to anybody that you don't know because phishing is not just online, it is also offline sharing information with people that you don't recognize or that who don't really need it, okay? And then lastly, to talk about software and copyright or something called intellectual property, okay? For software, you have the licensing of software and then you have open source, which is free. So software licensing provides software use. Um, the company keeps the ownership. You can purchase multiple licenses, but they cannot be sold or copies cannot be made to be given out, okay? And of course, open source is free to use. Um, in computer programming, we use a lot of um, open source um, software that is free for um, people to use, okay? And then um, intellectual property for copyright, okay? This you have personal copyright and you have work for hire. So personal is you own the copyright. So if you created your own personal web page, you designed that, you got your own personal copyright for that. But if you created a web page for an employer, you don't own the rights to that web page or that website. The company owns the copyright. Okay. So that's what work for hire is. And then the definition of intellectual property is just creations of the human mind that give value to others, okay? So that's just a little short tidbit on what intellectual property is. Um, and you may go more into this um, in a marketing class or sales class in the future, um, but this is just a short um, little synopsis of what intellectual property is. Okay. And then there's actually something called the Creative Commons, okay? so. You can visit www.creativecommons.org to um, check out 
the different licensing options that they have. Um, Creative Commons allows use and distribution of software and anybody can copy and distribute it to others. Now the difference between a Creative Commons license and a public domain is that on a public domain, those they keep all the rights. But with a, a Creative Commons license, they only keep some of the rights, okay? And that's because parts of it can be distributed. If you're on a public domain, you can't um, distribute those rights, okay? And this is just a, you know, a um, the short description of the Creative Commons licenses that we have. Um, you can definitely um, read more about those in your textbook as well. Okay, so these discussion questions are actually going to be in your um, discussion section, okay? Um, number one, what would you say to a teenage girl who wants to post inappropriate pictures of herself on her social media page? Number two, do you believe employers research the social media pages of their interview candidates? Number three, describe a situation where a weak password can be dangerous. And number four, what are the benefits of creating your own intellectual property? All right. So that is the end of our lecture. Um, I pray that you got something out of that that you could definitely um, use and definitely start to use right away as you are, um, you know, applying these things to your life. Um, I definitely believe that um, this is important to know, especially when you um, are working with certain things and you're online and you're trying to build up your following. There are going to be a few people out there who try certain things. And so if you keep these things in mind, you keep these tools in mind, you will definitely um, succeed in this area. So thank you for watching and I'll see you on our next lecture.